Well, good evening and welcome to the Living Water Livestream Bible Study. My name is Bernardine Wormley Daniels, Soterios Ministries Incorporated, and it is my privilege to be here with you on tonight, praise God, with another Bible study. Um, we are sanctifying this day, <laughs> amen. Amen. I know for a lot of people, this is uh, Halloween. Um, we don't do Halloween. I don't anyway. Have it for, we used to do that years ago, maybe when my kids were real small. And then I remember back in the day, um, the Exusia days, we used to have a harvest festival for the kids um, so that they would have like a Christian um, uh, alternative to you know, the, the paganism of, of the day. So for those of you who are not celebrating uh, that occasion, I'm glad to have you here with me on the Living Water live stream Bible study. Amen. I spent the last several weeks um, um, just doing a follow up to my workshop that I did on um, hearing God through dreams and visions. So for the last three weeks, we talked about um, another approach to dreams. I'm going to let that go and pick up another topic on tonight, praise God. The notes, the updated notes are on my Facebook page. They are there for you to download so that you can um, follow along uh, with me, praise the Lord. Um, let's pray, oh, one announcement real quick. Um, this weekend, beginning Friday, at 7 p.m. promptly, okay? We will be doing the As in the Days of Noah workshop, okay? Or seminar, whichever name you wanna call it. It's an in-depth study into what did Jesus mean when he said that his coming would be as it was in the days of Noah. What does that mean? So we're going to take a look at what was the spiritual, cultural, political context. What, what, what was going on in the earth in the days of Noah that led to the flood. And then even afterwards, because after they come out of the ark, you're still in the days of Noah. There were things that, that happened even in that whole context. What did Jesus mean by that? Well, who are the Nephilim? Who are the watchers? Where did demons come from? Um, what is the return of Christ? We're gonna, we're gonna look at all of it. If you have not registered, the link is on my Facebook page. You got a couple more days to sign up. It is a free workshop. Of course, we can't operate without your support. So we do ask that those of you who participate, just be prepared to give an offering. I'm giving you my study manual for free. Yes, I could charge for it. Other ministries would probably charge you 30 to 50 bucks just for the manual. We're doing it for free, um, but we will take up an offering, okay? So that's this Friday, seven to nine, and then Saturday, bring lunch with you. We're gonna start promptly at 10 a.m. and I'll teach until around 3, 3.30 or however, if we get finished before then, that'll be good. But it will be exciting. I'm absolutely sure I will say things you've not heard before, but that are in your Bible and it's an exciting class. So sign up for that. If you can't come in person, we will be um, at um, Faith Tabernacle um, Worship Ministries, which is led by um, my friend, um, Apostle Gloria Wilder, um, her husband, they're the leaders there. Um, they're hosting us, praise God, allowing us to be in that space. I'm so very grateful for that. And, um, uh, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, and it will be on Zoom. So if you can't be there in person, then um, you um, can um, um, participate via Zoom. But you need to register, okay, so that I can send you the information 
that you will need to be able to um, be with us. All right. So having said that, the information is on my page. Let's jump in to a new topic. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the sanctity of this moment. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to gather together like the disciples of old, to sit at your feet, to break open the bread of life, to drink deep, <laughs> to, to just um, uh, pour in um, the living water of um, the Lord that flows from the throne of God. Uh, we need you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite you to just brood over the top of us, birth something new, something transformative in our hearts. Um, take the seed of the word and plant it within us, producing fruit um, that'll bring glory uh, to your name, holy God. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Think through my thoughts, speak through my words, have your way. We love you, Lord, on today. Amen and amen. Let's see if I can get my comments loaded. All right, here we go. Good evening to Kathy, um, Sally, um, my daughter, Shakaya, Catherine. Um, wait, 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 where to go? My friend Faith and her husband. Um, good evening, uh, Loretta. Laverne, good evening to Brenda, good evening um, Joyce, Tanya, praise God, good evening, good to see you guys. All right, hope you have your notes. Listen, I want to talk about holiness. Um, I, I have a, a, a friend who also is in ministry, a prophet. And um, he happened to send me a, a, a link saying, hey, have you seen this? And so I clicked on the link and I had not seen it. And of course, a lot of the body of Christ, Christian magazines, news outlets have been um, talking about um, what's happening at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. Um, um, and you can go to their site, look into it for yourself. There's all kinds of very, very, very critical allegations that are coming against um, the senior leader there. And um, it just kind of shook me. You know, whenever I see um, um, a fellow clergy person um, in that kind of situation, it always shakes me. It shakes me to the core because we are all sinners saved by grace, you know? And it's the type of thing that makes you take a step back and say, let me check my heart. Let me examine my own heart. So if you've not um, seen, um, you know, those articles or, you know, just go to the IHOP KC and you'll see um, some um, videos and things about what's going on there. But what it, what it did was it, First of all, it prompted me to pray, to pray for the entire leadership team there, to pray for all of the people that connect there, to pray for the house of prayer there that has been going nonstop for decades, 24 seven worship and intercession. Um, it is a critical hour. Um, if you haven't been paying attention, you know that God is shaking um, the church, he's shaking uh, the world. You know, there are things that are happening that just draw you um, to your knees. So be praying for IHOP, um, be praying for any victims um, that have in any way been harmed, spirit, soul, or body by anything that's happening there. And it's a call for us to take a step back and to examine our own hearts and lives, you know, to, you know, take a look at um, what are we doing and how are we living? Yeah, Catherine, I was very upset um, by the um, allegations as well. I mean, I have followed 
the leadership there for years, you know, um, that whole concept of 24 seven prayer. I mean, it was very prevalent, particularly back in the old Exusia days. We had a house of prayer. We never made it to 24 seven, but we used to have the watches and, you know, we had a house of prayer where you use the combination um, door lock to get in 24 hours, seven days a week. Had a strong emphasis on prayer, you know, in our ministry. So listen, when you're in leadership, you well, listen, not just in leadership. If you are a believer, you have a target on your chest and on your back. You have an enemy of your soul, okay? If you are in leadership, you have a bigger target because what you do affects, if you fall, you fall on a whole host of people, okay? And so when we look at what's happening in the world today, around the world, we're in a, a it's a warfare season. It's a time of war um, in the spirit, in the natural. Um, when what, what you see manifesting in the natural is always the byproduct of what's going on in the spirit realm. And the spirit realm is very, very real. Um, matter of fact, let's pray um, real fast over all of the children that are out. I know my grandkids are out with their mom. Um, let's, let's pray over their, Lord, we just speak protection over all of the innocents, the innocent children that are out um, today on this night protect them from hurt, harm, danger, protect them from those forces that like to prey on the innocence of children, protect them that they won't fall victim to some um, debase, um, perverse mindset that wants to do them harm, either physically or, you know, through the things that they collect at strangers' homes. Lord, we just plead the blood of Jesus over the children in the greater metro Detroit, Detroit area, um, the, the um, Ipsy Township, the, this entire region, Ann Arbor, um, Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Southfield, where, Canton, Westland, Inkster, just over the children in this state. Protect and keep them in the name of Jesus. Amen. And listen, grab your Bible and let's take a look at this because <clears throat> I believe that we are in a Psalm 91 season. Okay, this is a this is a go-to psalm. This is a psalm that we should endeavor to set to memory, you know. I might put this on my list of scriptures to memorize. Just break it down two or three scriptures at a time until I memorize the whole thing. But Psalm 91 is something we should pray over ourselves, over our family, over our church, um, over your sphere of influence, over this nation, over Israel, um, over the, the church around the world, particularly the persecuted church. But here's what it said. Let me, let me remind you of what Psalm 91 says. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, that's where, we, that's where you want to be in Christ, okay, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. You declare that over your life and over all those um, things that I mentioned. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. 
A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. This, the, when we make the Lord our dwelling place, look, look at what it says. The most high who is my refuge. When I make him my dwelling place, when, when I declare that he is my refuge, verse 10, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Say it again for the people in the back. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, the angels, on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Now, all of this is contingent upon you abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. It is contingent upon us drawing near to him and making him our habitation. Okay. Now um, look at verse 14. This is where we were going. Um, be, so, so when we make that, when, when that's our reality, then God begins to release a word over our life. And here's what he says, verse 14. He says, because he holds fast to me or because the one who does the things that were spoken of in verses 1 through 13, that person, because that one holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So when we draw near to him and we abide in him and we're in that kind of season, when you're, when warfare is going on all around you and in the world, we want to be under the shadow of the almighty. We want to hold fast to him in love. We want to call upon his name. That word call is the Hebrew word kara. It means to encounter. We, we, when, when, he, um, uh, when we, we encounter him in the place of prayer, we call out and we cry out to him in worship, you know, in praying a song, singing a prayer. He says he will answer. And so I think that's the season um, that we're in. And, and you have to know that that place in him is a holy place. Okay, so I want to talk about holiness tonight because holiness is one of those things that people don't like to um, discuss a lot of times um, in the church, uh, definitely not in the world, but holiness is the prerequisite for seeing God, okay? So one, one of our, our greatest failing as a people who call ourselves believers is, is in not realizing who God really is and what his character is like. You know, the, the, there are lots of um, words that describe um, the, the nature of God, but you need to know that all of those descriptive terms like refuge, fortress, deliverer, redeemer, um, king, um, bridegroom, lover of my soul, all those terms are clothed in holiness, okay? Be if, if When you want to know who God really is, God is a holy God. And I think that we need to, we forget that. We, we have to remember that or we will end up lunch for the, the enemy, okay? He'll be, he'll be eating our lunch and then eating us. So God is God. And because he is God, you need to understand that there is an infinite gap between the highest 
in us and the lowest in God. Okay, on your best day, on your best day, you still need to pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay, you know, the, the highest in us is, is a, a, there's an infinite gap between our absolute best and his a, absolute worst, if there is, was a worst or the lowest in God. The gap between God and us is unbridgeable from our side, okay? You cannot bridge the gap between you and God. If, if the gap is to be bridged, it has to be from God's side because God is holy, okay? And it takes him to bridge. That's why Christ had to come because we can't bridge the gap. If you try to do it in your own strength and in your flesh, you end up with the Tower of Babel and all that madness, them trying to climb up into the heights and bring the gods um, down again. But that's all. You got to come to my class this weekend to figure out what that's all about. But God is holy. Real quick, let's look at a couple of these passages of scripture. Leviticus 11, Levit I'm using the ESV today, Leviticus 11 verses uh, 44 through 47, for I am the Lord, that's the yod Hey vav Hey. I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, where wherever Egypt has been for you in your life, beloved. He's the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So whatever holiness is, we need to figure out what that is and we need to live there, pitch your tent right there in holiness. The, the, here's, here's how we get in trouble. Be, we forget who God is. We, 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 we snatch our hand out of his and we start running in a different direction. And listen, listen, the gifts are without repentance and they work by faith and grace. <clears throat> so you, so we can be, and let me just speak today, like from the posit, from the posture of someone in leadership in the body of Christ. We, we can be incredibly gifted. That does not mean that we live in holy. Okay, you you have to you have to 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 be intentional about pursuing holiness because you could be, um, for instance. Like I could be like a mad guitarist. I mean, do all kind of riffs, you know, all kind of, you know, finger picking combinations, you know, and, and, and just play people in, into tears. That does not mean that I'm a good person because I'm talented or gifted. Okay. So we have to learn the difference. And when we're in leadership, we know the difference. When you have been in Christ, when you, 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 a lot of times people know how to fake it. Okay, let me keep going. All right, where was I? I, I went somewhere in my head <laughs> because um, we got to do better in the body of Christ. Okay, so um, God is holy, Leviticus 11. Oh, let's flip over to Leviticus 20 real quick and verse uh, 26. Leviticus 20 and verse 26. He says, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So if God is holy, then we're supposed to be holy. Whatever that means, that's how we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to operate like the world system, like the cosmos, like the world system, okay? And so here's the definition. What is it? What is holy? Uh, holy means to be set apart. The, the Hebrew word kadosh, 
Kadosh. It, it's a sacred thing, you know, consecrated, dedicated. It, it makes me think about how growing up, you know, um, you know how your 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 mama had back in the day had a china cabinet where the good the good dishes were. <laughs> The good ones, you know, that you didn't eat off of every day. They were set apart. Essentially, they were holy, if, if, if we could use that term. And the only time those dishes were used were on special occasions. And in my home growing up with my mom, um, that was um, Easter Sunday after church. Thanksgiving and Christmas. That was the only time those dishes were used because they were kadosh. They were set apart. Any other time you ate off of paper plates or the, the plastic, you know, stuff, you didn't eat off the china, okay? So kadosh, it's a sacred thing, something that has been consecrated, dedicated, holiness. There's another term, hagios. Hagios, it means... Um, sacred, holy, something that is physically pure. Did you get that? Physically, pure, morally blameless, hagios, consecrated, a saint. Another word is hieros, and it means set apart for God. So all those words you will find translated um, in the Greek and the Hebrew as holy, okay? So God is set apart from the power, the practice, and the presence of sin. Did you get that? God, because God is holy, God is set apart from the power, the practice, and the presence of sin, and is set apart to absolute righteousness and goodness. That's why Christ had to come, okay, so that we could be reconciled to God because sin separates us from God. Okay, so there is no sin in God and God can have nothing to do with sin. Okay. Look at, let's go New Testament, flip to the back of the book. First John, let's look at first John three. So we gotta, we gotta come up to another level in this season. First John three verses four through 10, because listen, you know, he's coming back, right? He's coming back and you want to be ready. You want to have oil in your lamp. You want to be living right. You, you, you don't want to be tipping and slipping and dipping. I'm telling you, I have been there, done that. I have lived like that. It is not good. It will separate you from him. Okay. And you can continue to operate in a certain level of gifting while you are separated from him because the gifts work by grace and 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 your 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 confidence in them they don't have anything to do with your uh sanctification okay okay let me keep going uh Balak and Balaam is coming up in in my mind um Balaam is is a referenced in scripture as a false prophet you know, like a, a, but he knew how to prophesy and he could get an accurate word, but his character was separated from God, was corrupt. Okay. Oh, um, Judas, Judas walked with Christ, was a disciple slash apostle of Christ. And yet he betrayed him. Okay. First uh, John 3, verses 4 through 10. Everyone, and I love the way the ESV captures the meaning of the Greek, okay? Everyone who makes a practice of sinning. If you're reading a King James, it'll say everyone who sins. But it's, a, it's in a tense in the Greek that makes it like a continuous present thing, meaning not just you make a mistake, because we all make a mistake. You you rarely can get through a day without sinning, you know, or making a mistake in some way. 
either in thought, in word, or in deed, okay? Um, but practicing overt, rebellious <clears throat> descent and departures from the word of God, that's a different thing. And that's what this is talking about. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared, talking about Jesus, in order to take away sins. And in him, in Christ, there is no sin or there is no practicing sin as a lifestyle. No one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning like as a lifestyle. No one who keeps on sinning as a lifestyle has either seen him or known him. So if you say, I know the Lord and you are living habitually without concern in blatant rebellious sin, you do not know him, okay? Um, little children, it says, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born or begotten of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed, the sperma of God abides in him. And the, like the sperma, the nature of God is birthed in us and working itself out in us. And it keeps us from sinning because we have been born of God. Okay. That's the word of God. So if we were to approach God, if you and I are to have intimacy with God, if, if we want to have unbroken fellowship with him, relationship with God, um, worship, pray, serve, adore, obey God, um, authentically, authentically, then we have to do it on God's terms, okay? We have to do it on God's terms. Okay, so look at this, Psalm 24. Psalm 24. If we're going to have relationship with him, we have to do it on his terms. Psalm 24 says, and verses 3 and 4, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? These are God's terms. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who does not who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Um, oh, let me let me keep going. Let me read it again. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. You know, that's one of the reasons um, uh, there's a spiritual discipline called the examen, examen, examen. Um, it actually, I think it's St. Ignatius, um, it's called the examen. Um, you know, you do have siblings. My spiritual director calls them siblings. We have brothers and sisters of other denominations, okay? You, we're not the only ones saved. The family of, of, of God is vast. Well, one of your siblings um, who has gone on to be with the father um, had a spiritual discipline called the examen. I highly recommend it. It's an examination of conscious, consciousness. I think I've taught on it before. And essentially at the end of the day, or you can do it in the middle of the day, several times a day, you simply pause and you examine your heart before him. How have you walked out the day? How have you, are your, are your hands clean? Is your heart pure? As you come to the close of the day, we need to exact, not give place to the enemy because it's the little things that when we say, ah, that's not a big deal. And we keep doing things that, that defile our hands or our heart, you open a door and regardless of who you are and how long you have walked with the Lord and how you can retie your bow tie and shaka zulu and robaba shikandarabasa, you, you can do all that. But if you have 
unclean hands and an impure heart, you will open the door wide for the enemy to come in. And I don't know why all of a sudden that makes me want to cry. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'll find some notes because um, I'm sure I have a study on it. It's called the examine. Uh, an examination of consciousness is something that we should practice before you dive, do your triple backflip, as my friend Betty would say, and dive into your bed at night. You should examine your consciousness and make sure that you are walking right with the Lord. You don't know that you're going to wake up the next morning. Okay, I'm just saying. I, 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 I'm I, just saying. Okay, um, let's keep going. So somehow you and I have to be made holy just as God is holy. And we, we, okay, any concept of holiness that falls short of God's standard for holiness will not be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. So therefore, because, and listen, I have had, well, I've had several encounters with the glory of God, but one encounter with the holiness of God, okay? And I was just a young person. I was about 19. And that was when the Lord came the second time in response to my praying for years and asking him what the vision I had as when I was about 11, what it meant and what, what did he want me to do with my life? What, I didn't know how to move forward with the vision that he had given me, which was a clear call um, into ministry. And when he showed up the second time, the first time when he showed up, he was standing there at the foot of my bed to the left foot of the bed. And, and, and I saw him. And when I saw him, he reached for me. And when I reached for him, we were immediately translated. And then his garments, everything were translated into this indescribable, indescribable white, unlike any white that you've ever seen on earth. And the glory, the light that emanated from his face, that whole encounter. You've heard me share that before. When he came the second time, he came this time in the fullness of holiness. And I thought I was going to die. Okay. The, I can't describe, and it, it really makes me want to cry. I can't describe his holiness. I mean, for real, for real, holy. And the, the, the only thing I could do was cover my face because I felt if I looked at him like I did when I was a child and innocent, now I'm 19, I'm a young adult, and I am a wretch live, living a sinful life, okay? But in his mercy, he came and he came clothed in holiness. And I was convinced my mother was going to, would have found, if I had looked, dared to look at him this time, she would have found me laying dead in my bed. That's how his holiness, the depths of, of, his, of his holiness is indescribable. It is not a joke, okay? And there have been times where I have wished that he would show up in churches like that. You know, we do this stuff. And listen, let me go down this bunny trail for a minute. We do this stuff. We have these gatherings and we say, oh, we had church. Oh, the glory of God came in. That kind of, Listen, if he really, 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 for real, for real, for real, showed up in our gatherings in the fullness of his glory and his, wouldn't nobody be running around? Wouldn't nobody be dancing? Wouldn't nobody be waving no flags? Wouldn't nobody be blowing no shofars? Everybody would be face down, face down. I'm here to tell you, okay? He is a holy God and he has made a way for us to engage him. And we, we, we should be so thankful and so grateful, but I wish that he would show up in holiness every now and then so that we would remember who it is that we're walking with because we, we snatch our hand out of his and we go skipping through the, the, the shadow lands as if all is well, 
and 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 when you and when we're leaders in the body of Christ and we know the word of God, then what we're doing is intentional, willful rebellion. Uh, now I have done some things in my life that I knew was not God. It was intentional, willful rebellion, and it requires repentance. Okay, let me come back. I went somewhere in my head. You and I have to be made holy. Any concept of holiness that falls short of God's standard will not be able to stand in the presence of God. Don't let anybody fool you, okay? Because of the holiness of God, we must live a new life in which our sins have been forgiven and done away with. And just because he forgave you your sins and wiped them clean does not mean that you can persist in sin. Paul, the apostle Paul in the Greek, it says, meganoito. It's like a, it, it's like, God forbid, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, um, I just had a funny thought that uh, a young theologian that I knew who, um, who was in seminary and studying Greek, she had a completely different translation of that, which just kind of made me snicker. But I'm not going to say it out loud. Um, um, God forbid is what it means, that meganoito. You cannot, because you have been forgiven and you live under grace, just live a life of rebellion and sin because God is good and God is love. And okay, you, you keep playing that game, okay? We have to live a new life and so that we can be as separated from sin as God is. In other words, we must be begotten of God. Like it says here in John, we must be born from above. So this means I am no longer who I was in Christ. I am a new creation. Sometimes we just need to have an aha moment. I, that you, you have to have a revelation of what that means. See, that when you have been begotten of God, the desire or that, 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 thing that you're doing that is wrong is not coming out of your born again spirit. Did you, did you hear what I said? When you have been born from above then, and Christ by his spirit comes in, then that thing that you have been doing in that way that you have been living is not coming out of your born again spirit. It may be an issue a, or a, a bondage in your flesh that is connected to your soul, but you can renew your mind with the word of God and you can crucify your flesh as your renewed mind and spirit link hands and war against your fallen flesh. Okay, so we can do this thing. We can live this thing. We can we can walk in holiness, okay, and righteousness. All right, with the help of the Holy Spirit because of His presence in us. So so when I'm born from above, I'm no longer who I was. Anything that wants to tell you that you are is a lie, and it's the devil. Okay, in Christ, I'm a new creation. My spirit has come alive in him. And so I cannot accomplish this on my own and I cannot do it in my flesh because your flesh operates on a pleasure principle. It wants what it wants when it wants without, it don't care how that affects anybody else. That's flesh, okay? Holiness requires divine intervention. This is the good news of the gospel, that Christ, our Messiah, the anointed one of God, died for our sins, having taken them, he took our sins upon himself, he carried our sins, and, and, and in so doing, he set, he set us apart from them, okay? Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 3, go New Testament, Romans Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 21 through 26. 
But the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all, you should circle all, have sinned. That's for all the self-righteous people who think that they never do anything wrong. Okay, all includes them too. Okay, for all, all us, we, we and us, all us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified not by our own works, but by his grace as a gift through the redemption <clears throat> that is in Christ whom God has put forward as a propitiation, meaning he's the acceptable sacrifice. He's, he's our lamb by his blood to be received by faith. Man, you if you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, you should highlight it. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Boy, that, that'll make you get up and run around the room right there. Then flip over to Romans 5. Verses 6 through 11, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still wallowing in our sins. Okay, wallowing isn't there, I and I inserted that word. While we were still in sin, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God because the wrath of God is real. Okay. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. If holiness is a summation of the character of God, and when, you know, we say, oh, Lord, I want to know you. Lord, I want to know you. I want to love you. Lord, I want more of you. Well, then you, you're asking for more holiness because he is holy. Holiness is a summation of the character of God. Then what does the word of God say concerning holiness? Holiness and righteousness, we need to know. Biblical holiness, we need to know today. In a world where everything go, I mean everything go, however you're feeling on any, oh, I'm changing my pronouns. Come on, all that madness. I, I identify, okay, let me stop. Let me not go down that, that hole. That's a dark hole. <laughs> I almost went down in there. Listen, what does the Bible say about holiness and righteousness? What is biblical holiness? What does the word of God say? Listen, 549 times in the Bible, the word holy is mentioned. That, and, and the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let, let a, a word be established. Not just two or three, 549 times. The word holy is mentioned in the Bible. The first use of the word is Exodus 3 and verse 5. The Lord speaking to Moses, put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. So Moses had one of those face down encounters. Take your shoes off, get down on your face. See? You encounter him like that, you'll understand. So recall that we're kadosh, a sacred thing, a sacred thing or a, a sacred place, okay? A consecrated, dedicated, hallowed apart, set apart. You should have kadosh, uh, um, a, set, a set aside space in your home. Just, it could be a chair, it's, but it's between you and God. It is kadosh. It's the place where you go to enter in, to intimacy and to fellowship and to commune with him. 
First Samuel two and verse two says, there is none holy like the Lord, none holy like the Lord. Isaiah six and verse three, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 57 and verse 15, for thus says the Lord, the, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. So not only is he holy, but his name is holy. First Peter 1 verses 13 through 19, it gives us a call to holy living. Look at it. Um, and these scriptures are in your notes. And I would exhort you to, you know, when you have free time, sit down with the notes and your Bible, look them up in your Bible, highlight them, underline them, make notes. You know, um, don't just take my word for it. I could be telling you anything. Try the spirit. Make sure that what I'm saying is of God. Okay. So 1 Peter 1, 13 through 19. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, you should circle obedient not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, meaning we not according to the way you and I used to live. We got to come up higher, come up higher. Tell somebody come up higher. <laughs> okay. But as he, which hath called you is holy. So you and I be holy in all manner of conversation, be holy in all conversation. Boy, that, and, and, and let me, let me say this, that's talking about more than talking. Okay. That is the Greek word anastrophe and it means behavior. So we are to be holy in everything that we do. I'll never, I was much, man, I was younger. I was, um, oh, 30, let's see, 30. Jerry was born when I was 31. Yeah, I was about 30. 31. Yeah, I'm going to say 31. And living in Florida, prophetic team. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll never forget. The, ministering to me prophetically, one of the, the, she was real bold. She came up to me like kind of pointing. She, and she, she, she laid hands on me three times. She said, you are anointed. You are anointed. You are anointed. She said, you cannot take the anointing off and hang it up in a closet when you feel like it. You cannot take it off and put it on. You have to walk in it. Okay. Now, not only did the young, the 31 year old me need to hear that, but the 63 year old me needs to hear that. Okay. You cannot take it off and on. So be holy in all manner of conversation, which is behavior. Okay. And all that we do, we cannot take off holy because we got a date tonight. Ooh, girl. And he is all that and a bag of chips. No, you got to be holy. Okay. Let me see. Let me, let me refresh my comments and see what y'all say. <laughs> Come on up higher. You got to be with, listen, you cannot hang holy up in the closet. It's Halloween. So I'm going out as unholy. No, no, <laughs> you can't hang holy up because it's Halloween. Be holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And if you call on the father who without respect of person judges according to every man's work. So God is not going to judge you according to what I have done. And he's not going to judge me according to what you have done. He's going to judge me according to what I have done and you accord. So take responsibility for whatever you have done because that's how God is going to judge us according to our works. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear 
Oh, you know, Jesus is my best friend. I am a friend of God. I'm a friend. Listen, I remember where I was when I heard the Lord say that I was his friend. I, I remember where I was, the posture that I was in. I remember it. But that doesn't mean that I should not have sojourn or walk through this life with an awe and reverence for my friend who is a holy God, okay? <clears throat> for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, you and I have been redeemed. So be holy, okay? Leviticus 11, for I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, set yourself apart, and you shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. Is over and over and over in the word. It's not an Old Testament concept. It is a right now concept. It, it is not, not for the New Testament church. Okay. Romans 12 and verse one, come on. You got that one memorized, many, many of you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. There's that word. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So in other words, that God isn't asking us to do something that's not achievable in him with the help of the Holy Spirit. See? So indeed, holy defines even the way that we are to worship. Psalm 96 and verse 9. Oh, worship the Lord. How? In the beauty of holiness. Worship him in holiness. Fear before him all the earth. That means with clean hands and a pure heart, with a life set apart and consecrated to him. Worship him from that place. Now we like to give him pieces of our life and whole parts back. We like to take the pie and cut it into pieces and give him a slice, a little corner of the pie. And we keep the big old larger portion of the pie for ourselves, see? No, 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 no. You, you, you can't walk with him like that. You have to worship him in the beauty of holiness. You got to give him the whole thing. Ephesians 1 and verse 4, according to, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, that's what we're called to. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. Having the, and see, let me say this. That's why everybody, everybody needs a spiritual friend. You, you need, let me rephrase it, a holy spiritual friend, okay? You, you, if, you're, if you're a pastor, ministry leader, home study group leader, by whatever you do in the body of Christ, you must have an accountability circle. You need, you need accountable discipleship. I'm going to have to get that going. We had that um, when I was a seminary student. Um, it was a, comes out of John Wesley, the holiness movement, accountable discipleship. You, you need to have a small group of friends who are mature who you guys can hold each other accountable to the faith because you live in a fallen world and the enemy is always aiming for you, okay? We cannot in arrogance because I know the word and I pray six hours a day, you know, that you'll just fall harder, okay? We need accountability. Um, so that we can be holy and without blame before him in love. 
Um, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let me go back to what I just said. If you're in leadership, you need to have accountability um, uh, friends who are have that same level of authority or sphere of influence or somebody uh, on, they, they don't have to be in a, a sacred setting, but somebody that it, it walks in that same realm, uh, that same level of authority. Because sometimes, um, uh, you know, people don't, you, you just need to have mature um, accountability. Let me just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I have a spiritual director. I have somebody to whom I am, I check in with. And then I have other pastors that I know that, um, you know, pastor, um, I'll say apostle. Um, I have one friend who calls and checks on me all the time to see how my soul is. And she has a level of maturity that I can really share with her what I'm really thinking and feeling. And then I have other friends. I have a really good friend, um, my friend in, in um, my girlfriend, I, who I call Farmer Ransom. And um, I can pretty much, in Arizona, I can pretty much tell my you, I think, just about anything, I think. So you got to have friends that you can check in with like that. You know, growing up as a younger person, my best friend, we still get together um, sometime and have lunch and we pick up right where we left off but she was my person back in the day particularly when i was living a scandalous life while i was in ministry there were things that i was struggling with you know and she was the one that i could call and and talk to about it and we went to high school together and um she was my person you need somebody like that okay and every single time she would talk me out of whatever stupid thing it was that i was getting ready to do we need it listen we need it today okay uh, we need one another i need you you need me we need each other um yeah i'm i'm gonna have to talk to i know some I got some pastor friends. We'll have to dialogue about that. I'll have to, I think Pastor Gloria is on here. Yeah, we'll have to chat about that because we need accountability and leadership. We do for real. And it makes me want to cry because oftentimes I think leaders feel like they don't have any place to go. They, 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 we, we, we tend to think, oh, you can't be vulnerable, you know, that you can't show your weaknesses. <clears throat> We need a place where we can do that. You know, the, the main place where we can do that is in prayer. And let me share this with you in light of what's going on with, with um, IHOP KC um, and um, uh, Mike Bickle. I remember years ago, this was when I was in Florida. I was a member of the Carpenter's Home Church with Carl Strader. This was a, this was a, 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 a um, the epitome of, of church, if you, you know, like a, if a pastor could dream, 10,000 seat church, 6,000 seats on the main floor, 4,000 seats in the balcony. Beautiful facility. I used to do sign language interpretation for the deaf community during um, the morning and evening services. I was a part of the healing team. That was during a time in my life when I had, I was away from, oh, that's where I started Soterios Ministries actually there. Um, and um, met with the leadership and um, they um, licensed me as a minister. And I was going through the process of like getting credentials through them and um, was, a, was made an elder um, at that church. And um, I'll never forget my appointment with Carl Strader, which was very intimidating. You know, you're in this massive office, like absolutely exquisite, beautiful in terms of offices and, and Christian paraphernalia and that kind of type of thing. But I'll never forget, <clears throat> he said to me, he said, why do you think Jimmy Swaggart fell? And I, at the time, I want to say, I think this was the second time he fell. Jim, Jimmy Swagger fell 
and then you know went through a process was restored and then he fell again so my my pastor Carl Strader asked me why do you think he fell and I thought about it. I was like man I, I have no idea and he said he was known Carl not Carl Strader Jimmy Swaggart for those of you who know I used to watch him as a kid him in that Bible he had this Bible with these big made out of this exquisite leather with the onion skin paint. He used to flop when he, he'd be in that stance. He was a preaching man back in the day. Whatever you think about him now, back in the day, he was a preaching evangelist, okay? Phenomenal preacher. And I used to watch him and think, man, I want to preach like that one day, you know, the way he commanded a crowd. And so when he asked me why he felt, I, I didn't know, because Jimmy swaggered amongst his peers was known as a man who devoured the word of God. He literally read through the Bible from cover to cover four, five, six times a year, like at least six times a year, cover to cover. And so why, and he asked me, I, 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 he, and his point was, how could a man like that, who had that much word in him, how could he fall? Because the accountability that was around him, he said, we saw some of the flaws and tried to tell him that he was in trouble, that he needed to take a step back, that he needed to repent. But he trusted in his own knowledge his own pride, I read the Bible, blah, 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 and he's trusted in his own strength and every, each time fell, twice, had to rebuild his, his ministry three times, the first time fell, rebuilt it, second time fell, rebuilt it, and this, this third time, he is, um, as far as I know, still going strong. He's an old man now, but still going strong. But that's because we need, we need the community of faith, okay? Um, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting, epiteleo, it means to fulfill completely. So to completely fulfill holiness, to accomplish holiness, to perform holiness, to do holiness, to make perfect the, the whatever holiness is, that being set apart, that walking with him, abiding that Psalm 91 space, doing that in the fear and awe and reverence of the Lord. We so busy trying to be that Jesus is my boy, you know, that's my road dog, that kind of thing. You know, we have relegated him to the status of one of our Facebook friends that we hardly know. Come on, you look at how many people, I mean, I think I have over 2,000 something. You know, some of those people, I don't know all of those people intimately. I don't, I don't have like accountability with, with all of the close. You, you have to have that. You, you won't survive without it. And you need to make sure it's the right person, that your person is walking with the Lord, okay? Or, or y'all, you know, speak into each other's life and challenge each other. Make sure your person is not crazy or need deliverance. Ultimately, the Lord, our God, wants to see us. He wants to see you and I, his church, this church, this cyber church, Bible study, all followers of Christ, he wants to see us clothed in holiness and righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he had made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you and I need to make every effort to be holy. Be is, a, is an act, it's a verb. To, to be holy, to exist, to be holy. See, no matter where we are, in line, at Meijer, checking out with our buggy full of groceries, holy. You know, at the gym, working out, holy. At the movie theater, holy. 
out on a date, holy for real, holy. Okay. Girl, he all that, you know, holy. Okay. Be holy. Watching the football game, holy. We Let's never forget, see? Let us never forget to be holy. <clears throat> okay. So um, Hebrews 12 verses 14 and 15 this is a good foundational text, and I have amplified it for you. Follow peace. Follow dioko in the Greek. Pursue. Follow after. Press forward. Follow up. Pursue peace with all men, with everybody, even the people you don't like. Let's, let's pursue peace, okay? <clears throat> let's agree to walk in peace. We can agree to disagree. That produces peace. Okay, I, I I disagree, but you be you. I'm a, you, I'm be me. We all right. Okay, follow peace with all person, everybody, and also dioko dioko pursue, follow after, press forward. Um, not only peace but holiness. Follow at pursue holiness, without which, without which that's the Greek word chorus. It means apart from without. No man, udes, that mean not even one, nobody, nobody, without holiness, nobody shall see optanomai, no, optanomai, um, it's where the optometry, you can hear it, that, that word in the English get, comes out of that Greek word, optanomai, shall see to gaze with wide open wise as, as, as if at something remarkable, the Lord. So essentially, follow peace with all men, follow holiness, follow peace with all men and holiness. So and follow holiness without what which no man, nobody, nobody shall see God, shall see the Lord. You're not going to see him without holiness. Okay. Looking diligently. That means to be episcopal. It means to be aware, be aware, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So, yeah, you need to walk this thing out. You you can't um, uh, um, rely on how many hours you spend in prayer, how many hours you um, spend in the word. You have to rely on God. You cannot lean on your own strength. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I think where we get where we where we turn and go skipping into the shadowlands is when we get we become so confident in our own abilities that we forget that that he is our strength that we need to we need to lean on him. OK. Um, so looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Revelations 22. Here's another passage that tells us, um, seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Luke 13. Oh, this is the passage that tells us to strive to enter in at the straight, the narrow gate, the one that is free from obstacles, standing close about. Um, for many, I shall say unto you, will seek, will desire to enter in and shall not be able. They won't have the might. They won't have the strength. They will not prevail, you know, because in order to come through the gate, you got to come by means of Christ. Hebrews 4, verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So there is a place of Sabbath rest, but it is in him. It comes from abiding in him. Then we can rest from um, the attack because we are resting under the shadow of the almighty. We've, we've learned how to abide in him and he in us. 
1 Peter 4, 17 through 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You know it starts with us, right? <clears throat> God is going to judge and it starts with us. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, that word scarcely is the Greek word molis. It means with difficulty, with much work, every day walking with him, abiding in him, loving him, surrendering to him every day. Oh, I got saved, you know, 35 years ago. You've been living like the devil since and think you're still going to slide on into heaven. You, you know, listen, I, I'm, I, I'm not a once saved, always saved person. I just, I think you have to walk it. I think you have to live it. You have to keep your hand in his hand. You have to uh, do live by his word. Trust him. You know, I don't think that you can practice sin habitually without repentance and still get into heaven. I, I don't believe that. I could be wrong, but I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. But, you know, what? just believe what the word says. You got some people that have this once saved, always saved mindset. And um, come on, I, I have been to school with clergy, friends that are pastors, hang out with pastors, Believers, apostles, prophets, and evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Some of the most scandalous people I know, some of them. <laughs> so, 2 Peter 3 and 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Be diligent. In other words, you got to walk it out. Some folk like to play games with God, see? Sinning, and they keep on sinning. They keep on practicing sin as a lifestyle. <clears throat> you know, he will deal with you. He, when you belong to him, he will tug at your heart. He will try to draw you back into repentance. I am a witness. Okay, you cannot practice sin as a lifestyle and be in Christ. He will deal with you. And if you ignore him and ignore him and ignore him and ignore him and ignore him, and he is long suffering, he will give you over to what it is that you, you think you want. Okay, read your Bible, your Bible. Read the first chapter of the book of Romans. Read the whole New Testament. John 5 and verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. John 8 and verse 11, no one, sir, she said, then neither do, oh, this is the woman um, who had been um, caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus to be stoned. Um, which was scandalous in and of itself. They were really trying to set Jesus up because you notice if she was caught in adultery, they didn't bring the man, which I thought was very interesting. Should have been two people, but they only dragged her. <laughs> uh, anyway, Jesus said, I don't condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Listen, God, guys, when you turn to him, he has open arms. He 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 wants to forgive us, okay? Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? This is the passage I was telling you about in the Greek. It says, may genoito, by no means, or God forbid. It's a very, it's almost like cursing, <laughs> which is how my, my young theologian friend translated it, but she was young. What can we say? By no means, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? If you and I are in Christ, then we have died to sin. We, how can you live in it when you die to it? So then we got to stop making excuses. Romans 6, 15, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means, that's what I was saying earlier. Because you're under grace, does that give you a license to just live any kind of way? No. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 
No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Everybody is tempted, okay? But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I didn't see no way out. No, the devil is a liar. You just closed your eyes to the way out. But when you are tempted, look at this, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now that's got the breath of God blowing on it. That's for somebody that's watching, okay? Um, when you are tempted, God is faithful. He will always provide you a way out so that you can stand up under it. And if you cannot see it, ask him to show you the way out. He absolutely will. I am a witness, okay? He will turn you in the direction of your exit. He will show you the way out because it's not his desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hebrews 10, if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth. Now, how did this get in the Bible for all of you once saved, always saved people? Hebrews 10 verses 26 and 27. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth. So this is somebody who was saved. If, but if they keep on sinning on purpose, rebelliously, deliberately, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now, don't get mad at me. Let's look that word up in the Greek. Let's see, Hebrews 10, 26. I want to see what that word deliberately is. I, I want to just see the strength of it in um, the, the Greek. Give me just a second. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. Here we go. For if I go on sinning deliberately, hekousios, hekousios, hekousios. It means voluntarily. If I go on sinning voluntarily, it means willfully, willingly, of one's own accord, means did nobody trick you? Did nobody trap you? Oh, this is this is the way that Adam sinned, okay, in, in, in um, Genesis. Um, Eve was deceived. Adam did this hekousios, he said. His sin was no better than her sin. Even though there's a whole segment of the church that likes to single her out, and use her as the reason why women are not supposed to be in leadership, as if the man's sin wasn't just as heinous, if not worse, because he sinned hekousias. That means willfully, voluntarily, of his own accord. Didn't nobody trick him. Didn't nobody trap him. He knew it was wrong. He did it anyhow. To sin willfully as opposed to sins committed inconsiderately and from ignorance or from weakness. So he, he didn't sin out of weakness. He didn't sin out of ignorance or um, inconsiderately. He sinned with his eyes wide open. So this passage in Hebrews is saying that when you and I sin with our eyes wide open, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, listen, that's why we need the Holy Spirit people. And particularly all you pastors, ministers, leaders in the body, team leaders, wherever, however you serve, listen, you must learn how, we have to learn how to walk with the Holy Spirit, you know, and not resist the Holy Spirit. We have to have this accountability in place. You need a friend. You need a friend. You know, those of you who are married, I, I would like to believe that on a good day, that person could be your spouse. Oftentimes, people don't have that type of vulnerability for some reason with their spouse. You And if you're a female, that accountability person should be another female, not a man, because then you're setting yourself up for all kinds of madness. You need somebody that you can talk to, okay? 
let, I'm, let, I'm just saying. First John three and verse six, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Oh, let me say this. When I was um, a part of, oh, and I got my certificate um, showing that I, um, um, I got my certificate for a spiritual transformation, that two year, almost two and a half year process that I went through. It was continuing education with the Transformation Center um, under Dr. Ruth Haley Barton. And we had small groups, okay? That whole large group of us, which was probably about, oh, more than 70, excuse me, oh man, maybe about between 65, 75 people. They had those groups broke down into um, small groups of, you know, like four to five. And those were our places where we could sh really share our heart. And there was a process that we used in sharing, which I would have to teach on at another time. I don't have time for that, but it really creates safe space because of the way that it is set up. I'll have to do like a leadership thing and share that with some of you because it really creates safe space where people can open up and share their heart and receive prayer and no judgment, that type of thing. Um, that's what we need. We need more of that in the body of Christ. We need to know how to do that. So 1 John 3 and 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin, if you practice in sin will, willfully, you, you have turned your head away from him and you are not knowing him intimately. 1 John 3 and 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed is in him. He cannot go on sinning. Practicing sin is a lifestyle because he has been born of God. 1 John 5, 18, we know that everyone born of God does not continue to sin habitually. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. God will pull you back into his embrace on your face down, face down or on your knees with weeping and travail and repentance. He, if you really know him, he will pull you back, okay? So beloved, our response should be to yield to God, to lean into the Holy Spirit with a repentant heart. Repentance is not a four letter word, okay? It's not a bad word. Repentance is a good word, okay? We will either repent, having a change of mind as we turn back to God, or we will perish. You will either repent or you will perish. Those are your only options. Luke 13 and verse 3, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. That's Jesus said that. I, you can drop your rocks, put your arrows away. I didn't write it. I'm just the messenger. It goes for me just like it goes for you. Okay. Um, oh, one second. Okay. Um, Acts 17 and verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. We're in that season. We're on the other side of Pentecost. We got the word of God, the spirit of God. We got no excuse. So he is commanding us to repent, to turn back to him. Second Corinthians 7 and 10, um, godly sorrow brings uh, repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Worldly sorrow is what I have you wanting to take your own life. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings you into his embrace with no, with no regret. Second Peter three and nine, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. He is being patient with you. He, he's being patient with you. Don't think you're getting away with anything. He's being patient with you not wanting you to perish, but for you to, he's giving you time to turn around. Oh, I'm out of time. <laughs> essentially this, one more, Galatians 5, 13 to 26, essentially this, crucify the sinful nature or risk losing the kingdom of God. That's Galatians 5, 13 to 26. And we will pick it up with Ephesians uh, next week. So next time we're going to do this, we'll talk about um, the, the will of God. We'll talk about today's church. Then we're going to go deeper and I'll tell you the difference between um, uh, holiness and righteousness. We'll look at what it means to, um, to um, um, 
walk with Christ and with him as our example. We're going to look at all of that. We're going to get through this season, beloved. We are living in perilous times, but we are not doing it alone. We have Holy Spirit and we have each other. Listen, the Lord loves you. He really does. And so do I. And I hope to see you, God willing, next week. Join me this weekend for my As in the Days of Noah seminar. You won't regret it. It will bless your soul. Okay, you can still register. The link is on my app under events or it's on Eventbrite. You have to sign up. It's free, but you need to sign up so I can email you the Zoom links and um, your um, student manual so you can get it printed out, okay? Because you're going to need it. It's a lot of notes. God bless you, beloved. I'll see you next time. I'll put some links in the chat where you can sow into the ministry. We need your support. I need your support. God bless you. I'll see you next time.